If you liked this episode of the Hockey IQ podcast, please leave a like, a comment, and especially review our podcast. If you truly listened all the way to the end and you're listening to this right now, you enjoyed this episode. Please go and give it a five-star review. That helps us out more than you know. Thank you so much and look forward to the next one. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Kevin Galerno. Uh, Kevin, owner, uh, not quite the founder, but early adopter of uh, TPH Hockey, doing a lot of great work uh, up in Ontario, and recently joined the Red Wings organization, done development camp in the past, now working uh, a lot with the minor league team up there in Grand Rapids, which uh, seems to be having a good playoff run. How, how's that been, Kevin? It's been really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You're right. Definitely not the founder. Got to give props to a a past guest of yours. Dwayne Blay is a good friend and definitely my development mentor um, over the last 15 years. Uh, But yeah, he kind of got me, he's been with Detroit now full time for three years and uh, got me, got me going there a little bit. And then, yeah, took on a role with the, with the AHL team under him and the development team there in Detroit um, in Grand Rapids. So yeah, they've been having a good run. They unfortunately, just just this last week uh, lost in a deciding game it was a tight one so they're they're done for that would have taken them to the semis but um but it was a fun year they're a really young team and i'm sure if you follow the the kind of nhl ahl you, you see you know there's a lot of talk about their prospect pool uh, i think steve steve eisman knows what he's doing there and and uh and yeah they got a they got a good a good slew of young talent there so it's been really fun to to get in there most importantly though like for me going there between guys like Dwayne and the coaching staff and the development team in Detroit, the coaching staff and GR, they've been awesome in terms of like they they understand what true development is. And yeah, they got to win games and they got to do their system stuff, but but they're super dialed into the individual like development piece. So it's been fun for me to be a part of. I've been very lucky. Yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there. I mean, these Ohio teams are getting better and better. Cleveland continues to roll. It's I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm Ohio proud. I'm biased, but uh, more and more stuff's going uh, well. And we we got a kid, uh, Sasha, who's going to be definitely mm-hmm. a top five, if not top three pick next year in the NHL draft. Great things are happening in Ohio. We just need to uh, ship it down to Toledo now to replace <laughs> that ECHL team. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're at, they're at, that's a good – in the coast, that's a really good spot to be. Yeah, they're awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just diving into working with players, I'm curious on – helping players evaluate their own game. Like it's such an important thing that I see out there that players tend to struggle with is getting the ability to accurately assess their game, whether that be where they are now and accordance to maybe where they need to go or just from a game to game basis of like, did I actually play well? Like how did I contribute? What was I contributing? That kind of stuff. So I'm curious from your perspective, you've obviously worked with a lot of players from the youngest ages all the way to the highest Mm -hmm level um you know how can we help players evaluate their own game accurately i think you said it like in the question we have to help them you know we have to we we can't just expect even even these ohl players or these junior players and college players to to really know know what what constitutes a good game sometimes and it starts really young like with young guys in the car you know or your young son or daughter in the car like not that you're going to be drilling a seven eight nine year old about how they played but like just casual conversation in the car hey how was the game today did you have fun um you know how did how do you think you played and not to like disagree or agree with them at the start but just get their opinions and um and who was really good who did you think you know other than you was really good out there and they they have their you know finger on the pulse they'll know like oh 17 and red was really good oh yeah what made 17 red really good oh i couldn't get the puck off him or he was really fast or she was she was she was really good on defense i couldn't beat her you know whatever it is and that starts the conversation with your kids where, like I said, you're not going to beat it home or drill it, drill it home too hard, but that starts the conversation where they understand why we're players really hard to play against or really good. And, and then when, as you get older, you know, let's say you have some higher level minor hockey players, um, I, they got to start to know who they are as a player, you know, what, what makes them tick? Like, what are they, what are the stronger parts of their game? What are maybe some holes in their game? Um, and, and cause when you get to the pro level, you're a little bit, not pigeonholed, but obviously you have much more of a role in minor hockey. Yes, you have a role, but I, I want, I'd like to see all minor hockey players get a chance to play everything. So even though you got a really good D man that plays tough and, you know, isn't, let's say the, the, the power play specialist on the point, 
can they add offense to their game? Should they know who they are? Yeah, they should know that they're to to make the, to make the jump. They're going to have to be tough, and they're going to have to have a really good stick, and they're going to have to have you know a good understanding of gap control and the D zone. But for that player, can they add offense to their game? Not end end rushes, you know what I mean? Not not changing everything about who they are, but like, can they add a little bit of offense just so they can get pucks through five on five and like create a little bit of secondary offense? So letting those other those older players as the, as they get older know this is you know a bit of who you are, but let's keep working on that stuff so it's it becomes more and more elite. But then add little little snippets of like other elements to your game to make you a little bit more versatile and. I don't, I mean, we've, you've seen examples of players that have grown, you know, maybe entered the NHL and were like a middle six or bottom six forward and grew to be a little bit more offensive, you know, or a D man that grew to be a little more offensive over the years. So it, it takes time, but I think those players just need to know who they are to start, you know, where their strengths and weaknesses are or holes. And then you can like help them grow from there, but it's got to be on them. They have to have a willingness to like hear you. And and be willing to like have the conversation, you know, what what do I struggle with? What am I great at? What do I need to keep doing? And that's that all comes from like trusting who you're talking to, your coaches, your skill guys, your parents, you know, whoever it is. All right. To oversimplify here, basically we need mm-hmm. to help them establish and find an identity. Yeah. Um, and then from there, basically just open-ended questions where they're kind of guiding the conversation. And then we can add our our two cents in to help give maybe a more accurate yeah. picture uh because because i love going through and I, I do this with my teams where i'll like give a sheet of like where do you rate all of your skills like five mm-hmm. being the best high school player in the state of ohio versus one being the worst player and then every single time a lot of fives a lot of fours and i'm like okay we're, we're, we're not even playing at the <laughs> highest level here like what if that was the yeah. case clearly we win state championships every single year like there, yeah. there's just that you know, you think you're better than you are sometimes. And, and that's very difficult. Um, curious how you combat that and how do we get an accurate picture? I, I find video tends to help a little bit of like, mm-hmm. does this look like a great shot? And then they're inevitably like, eh, maybe it isn't that great. Or like, I remember the first time I watched video of myself and be like, I am so terrible. And <laughs> I felt like I got miles better just by watching myself. Yeah, totally. And to to like to go off what you said in terms of oversimplifying it, I think that's really accurate. And I think letting them know that, but like not not making them feel pigeonholed is the only thing I'd add to that. Like, oh, this is who you are. This is who you're going to be for the next 12 years if you want to keep playing. Like, no, this is kind of who you are right now. It's a bit of your identity, but you can you can build off that. You can grow for sure. Um, and then, yeah, I, I agree. Like I'm, I think a lot of hockey players, a lot of just people in general are visual. That's why we use video and that's why we use coaching boards and, and, you know, examples. We run through things slow, you know, at practice or whatever. And, and, uh, in between periods, like draw it on board, things like that. So I think showing the players is massive. And then like, to your point, like we're all a, a, a big fish in a small pond. Like there's a lot of players out there, you know, and there's a lot of really good players like in Ohio, even at the higher level. And then when you get outside of Ohio and then when you look to the rest of the U.S., you know, and same thing happens here. You know, let's take the Alliance, which is the the AAA center that in, in London, Ontario, where I'm at, you can be a really good player in, in London. And then you can be like, whoa, there's some really good players in the Alliance. And then you're like, well, let's include the OMHA and the GTHL. And yeah. there's some really good players there. So just making your players aware and we're talking about a certain type of player here we're not talking about like kids that are just playing for fun or and everyone should be playing for fun but the kids that are really want to like improve you got to know and and play at the next level you got to know it's a big it's a big fishbowl out there and there's some really good players so yes you're doing great things but to your point like you know the the video part may be a chance to be like can we can we do a little better here can we you know can we get outside our box a little bit and 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 this is what elite, this is what you did. It's awesome. And this is what like really elite players are doing or players the same age as you are, are doing these types of things. Yeah. That's, that's a key piece of like, okay, maybe you feel like you're the best player on this team, but is that good enough? Like eventually we need to start looking like, can I be the best player on the ice? Can I be mm-hmm. the best player in the league? Can I be the best player in the world? Whatever that is um, for those top end players. But I'm always curious about maybe not, always the top players we always want to go there like it's totally. super obvious and super sexy almost but also just like helping that guy at the bottom of the the roster um you know understand you know what is their current identity they might not always be that because role is relative um but just 
in life, right? Like we all have to have that ability to self-reflect and have an accurate assessment so we can best improve. Um, I guess a classic example would be like players adjusting to not being like the guy or the girl whenever they go up a level. Uh, Cause that could be a big challenge on many different levels, especially their confidence. Uh, curious your thoughts. Well, yeah, I think we like uh, we were talking about this a little bit before too, and and I, I think we all have this picture of what how your hockey path should look, and it's the McDavid's and Bedards, you know, it's like the best player all the way up, and you got TSN stories written about you, and then you get you get at sixteen you get drafted, and then you're in major junior, and you're the best player, and then you get drafted again at eighteen, and then you're playing in the NHL at 1920. Like that's not the picture for like not even one percent. That's not that's not even the route for. Point zero 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 one percent, you know. So I think just knowing knowing um, that being in the middle of the pack is where most of us sit. Us as in you know players that were were a lot better than probably yeah me. that that bell curve <laughs> yeah like being in the middle is totally fine. It's what are you going to do with it? Are you willing to like keep working at it to improve? Like if, if you stood in a room right now and and you probably have this with 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 uh, your high school team. Like if you stood in the room and said, hey, how many players want to play at the next level? How many guys would raise their hand? probably everyone, you know, probably, probably most. And then you said, and then how many players are doing like, are willing to do these five things to like get to that level? There's probably everyone would raise their hand, but only half or less than half would do it. And then how many players were, are willing to do these 10 or 20 things over the next year, year and a half to, to like really improve and make sacrifices and do this and do that. There's probably only one or two that are really a bunch that will say they will, but there's only one or two that will really do those things or, or less in, in, on some teams. So it's hard to actually do that. Um, and that's why certain players in the middle of the pack are able to make the jump. It's not always the best player all the way up. Right? Yeah, we played on the same team for seven years of minor hockey and this player was the best player. Um, and, and are they always the one that make it sometimes, but sometimes not like I didn't get drafted in the OHL draft. And I think there was like six players on my team that did, I ended up playing farther than all of them. And that's not to talk about me. It's, it's more to just say I was like, okay, but like not that great. I'm very undersized. And I was just say, I just worked really hard. I was able to learn, and, and if you're able to do that, you're able to, you're able to like surpass players that are maybe more skilled than you. So um, I think that's the key is just like stick with the process, have a plan, you know, talk to people you trust. And then, and then are you willing to do the things that'll make you successful? Not like this year, but next year at the next level. And that's the key is like, don't plan for this year, start prepping for what's going to make you successful at the next, next year, next level. Um, and that's a, that's a really tough one for kids and parents to understand. Yeah, and I feel that a lot of parents and players end up falling into the trap where more is better, when 100%. that is not the case. Like, yes, you can't you got you can't just show up to practice and show up to games. Like, there's a lot more that goes into this, right? Like, mm -hmm. developing yourself athletically, physically is is super important. Um, but I, I know you find that a lot of people fall into that trap of more is better. And they're just trying right. to get on the ice as much as humanly possible. And they just go, go, go. Oh, there's another opportunity. And it's almost like a checklist, like a coach maybe sends over a recommendation of things to do this summer. And she's like, check, 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 check. It's mm -hmm. like, maybe you should select just a few and you know, go mm -hmm. enjoy yourself a little bit. So I'm curious um, for, for you, cause, cause more is not always better. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's not, it actually is more hurtful than helpful. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I mean, you've seen this with, some of your kids that are on, on the ice seven, eight times. And sometimes that's, that's, you know, you, you're, if you play triple a or double a, you're on the ice one or two games, maybe more. And then two or three practices, you're on the ice five times with your team, maybe this week. Plus you got a couple development sessions, you know, during the season in the off ice, maybe you're doing development three, four five times a week. Like, and there's times where that's important. I'm a big believer in, in like multi-sport athletes. So just taking time away from the rink, I think just hitting a baseball is just good for your overall athleticism and hand eye. And so those things, but also just taking time, just, just taking time away from the rink and can, can one or two or even three really good development sessions be better for you in the off season than six. Of course they can. You're going to be more dialed in. You're going to be more mentally and physically ready. You're going to be more excited to be on the ice. You know what I mean? Rather than just checking the box that, Hey, I had my little guy on the ice six times this week most in, in my experience, most of the time we see kids like that, they're mentally not there the whole time. They just can't be, it's way too much ice. So monitoring that and every, every kid, every parent's a little bit different. And there's not, I don't think there's like a, a magic number. This is what you should do. Everyone's a little different. I just think monitoring that is, is super important. So it's not overdoing it. 
giving your kids, you know, what you want at, at the end of the day, if you're son or daughter liked the piano you'd have a piano at home and a keyboard you know it's a slippery slope because you they could play the piano all day and you wouldn't no one would say anything but then sometimes with hockey you know and this is me kind of playing both sides of the sword like sometimes with hockey you're like oh they're on the ice too much like i think you just have to monitor and and make sure it's a, a reasonable amount on both sides so not too much not 12 months a year um and making sure that it's it's the right amount so they're getting better but it but they're they're dialed in whenever they're on the ice yeah, there's that intentionality behind it. It's not just putting in the hours. It's, you know, can you be there mentally engaged working on something? Because mm. you, you can just get on the ice. And this this will lead us perfectly into practice environments of <laughs> like, if you're just there going through the motions or you're just, you know, going there for a puck mm. touch or the, the classic, like, you know, make them sweat. You yeah. Know, you're just there for the sweat. And like, eh, maybe it's not the most helpful thing out there. Like, there, there's many ways to cut this. Um, and, and the the basic piece is like, is the player still excited to go to the rink? Mm-hmm. What is their plan personally? Like they need to be able, and it shifts obviously, like you're going to take more ownership of your game the further you get along. But like having that intentionality of, okay, what are you working on today? And being able to have that process and plan for what am I trying to get out of this rather than just putting in hours to put in hours. Totally. I mean, you can go back to, to, you know, the 10,000 puck challenge, which is, you know, shoot, ten, which I love it. Any coach that or parent that challenges their players to go shoot pucks at the end of the day. And I know you're talking about on ice and I'm just trying to make it like, you know, understandable for everyone. But, and at the end of the day, if you're shooting pucks, is your shot going to get better? Yeah, probably it's not going to get worse, but could you shoot less than 10,000 pucks and have a better outcome over six months? Of course you could, you know, if, if, my little guy runs downstairs and I only have little, little guys right now that they're, they're not into, into this yet, but they ran downstairs and they came up se- seven minutes later and they said, uh, Hey, I shot 200 bucks. Be like, sure. That's awesome. Could in that seven minutes or in four minutes, could they shoot 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks and have, have a little bit of a more of a positive outcome for sure. They could, you know what I mean? If their eyes are up and they're not just like ripping pucks from a pile as quick as they can. And, and they're making a move before it, or they're looking past and then shooting or, you know what I mean? Accepting a pass, then shooting. Like, would that be better than more pucks? In most cases, probably. They're focusing on their posture, their hand positioning, their weight, whatever, you know, whatever you want to focus on. For sure, there's a, there's a fine line between quantity and quality. And that's on the ice, you know, in terms of reps. And that's, and that, that could be, you know, go to something like I'm talking about, which is just the puck challenge. Now, I'm not putting down the, the te- I love the fact that coaches challenge their kids and, and, you know, put little things out there and they, cause it does motivate the kids. I just, is there a way to maybe take that, you know, talking about that challenge, is there a way to take that and say, Hey, I want you to shoot a hundred pucks over the next week. And I want you to take a little video of yourself and the first hundred, I want just all wrist shots. So eyes up being super accurate, picking your spot. And then the next challenge is like another hundred pucks and it's going to be taking all the pucks off your backhand. So getting them off your back end into a shooting position, eyes up and, and making a move, you know, and then the next hundred are whatever it is, make a fake and go to your forehand or, or kick them out of your feet, like a lost puck or a bad pass, you know, could we do that and st- still make it stimulating and engaging for the kids, but then also make it maybe something that'll help translate a little more rather than what I said, like pucks two feet away, just like reaching and dragging, reaching and dragging kind of senselessly or mindlessly, but um, so I think it's it's just a fine line. But at the end of the day, if if you're motivating your kids, then then yeah, it's 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 always good. It's it's always good. I just think we can probably dial in a little bit. And that, that goes to off ice and of course on the ice. Same, same with our reps. You know, the same drill you've done every second, every Wednesday practice, you start with the same drill. So the kids are now monotonously and and with and and I think routes and things are good, but they know when to leave, where the pass is coming from, where the shot is, where the re- they know all the details of the drill. Could we start the drill with a rim? Could we start the drill by making the stationary passer making a move and then passing? Like I think we can add those things in that make it make that same rep that they've been doing just a little bit, you know, a little bit more variance or, or variability so that it, it might be closer to something they see in a game. Yes, more game like is usually better um uh, in general. Totally. Okay. That's a perfect little segue to just yeah. kind of like practice environments and mm. practice activities that we choose. Um, you know, I, I think the 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 nice whipping boy we have today is what we call the flow drills. You know, like there there might be moments where we do one or two every once in a while to kind of maybe get some general ideas mm. of positioning as a unit. 
but uh, quickly should not be like the go-to every single Thursday uh, before a game. Um, you know, like what is a good practice environment, a good modern day practice environment or activity look like for a, a Kevin Galerno? Well, I mean, I'm different than, than a coach, let's say, cause I don't have to worry about systems. You know, I don't coach a team necessarily. So I don't worry about the systems part. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, if I coached your high school team, I would just do skill development. No, you got to worry about the specialty teams and your, your D's, you know, you have to spend X amount of time on that stuff. Um, now I'm, I'm, I love that you brought up flow drills. Like it's such a, as a player, I think back, it was the best thing in the world to do. Now I probably have a little bit of a different, uh, you know, viewpoint of it, but I, I, I agree with you. Sometimes it's great. Just touches. You get everyone moving. You get two or three guys going, you know, yeah. Touches and shots and, and, and pace. It's great. But I think specifically with flow drills, a lot of coaches are like, Hey, we're gonna do all these flow drills. Everyone's going to be, you know, snapping the puck around, get their feet moving. And that's going to help us move the puck faster tomorrow, which I disagree with. I don't think tomorrow when you do that on Wednesday night, the flow drills with all these guys where, like I said, a couple minutes ago, they know where the pass is coming from, where to go next. They know all the details. That's not going to help you move the puck better at tomorrow's game. And you're going to get to the game big. Oh man, we made so many good passes yesterday and, and we finished on all of our shots. And then today we got nothing. Well, that flow drill looks nothing like what you're going to see. All the passes were perfect because you're, your passes were stationary at all four blue lines and the the guys were whipping around the ice. You know what I mean? And the ice was good. It was at the beginning of the practice. The players passing didn't have to worry about like being tired being cause they were, they didn't have to worry about moving. They didn't have to worry for the most part. Passes were good. So that means the players moving, were picking up easier passes. They had no pressure. You know what I mean? So that flow drill looks nothing like what they're going to see tomorrow. If we want to get our players to, you know, tomorrow we're like, Hey, we got to get the puck moving quick. We got to get make be, be, are consisting of passes. We've got to complete more passes. We've got to get more shots through. Then we have to z- design a mock flow drill where our passers are going to throw game-like passes, meaning not as good. Our, our players picking up the pass have to pick up the pass and also have to worry about like where a little bit of pressure is coming from. Uh, and then our shots, we can't just get a pass to the blue line and skate to the hash marks and then rip it knuckle because how often does that happen? We got to get shots from outside the dot. We got to get players crashing the net. You know, we, we got to make that flow drill. We got to gamify it a little bit so that, so that in the game um, it's going to seem a little bit more, and then we can start making plays. You know what I mean? Pulling up at the blue line, making a hard cross ice and have that guy driving in, you know, that just like the flow drill we did yesterday, you know, so we just got to make it look a little bit more like it will tomorrow. And the problem with that is like, it's so visual, meaning, Coaches are very worried, and they have to be because it's part of their job. It, it, you know, and it's part of getting their job back next year. Practice, I think there's a uh, a misconception that it has to look a certain way, and the way the misconception is it has to look really clean, it has to look really good, no mistakes, everyone moving. Well, it doesn't have to look that way. There's a there's a certain level of like ugliness that has to happen in it, so that our players are learning, so that they're learning one, and then also it looks like the game will, which games are ugly, so that they're they're learning from it, you know, but as coaches, we're very worried about, about how it looks because parents, you know, parents and you want to get picked again, you know, for, to be the coach next year. And it's a, I'm not saying don't like, it, it's a fine line and, and I get why coaches do it. There's certain things that, and if a drill's not going well, what do coaches do a lot of times, scrap it, you know, well, sometimes it's just important to stick with it, even though it's ugly, you know? So, and I know that's like, that's long winded. And, and, but to go back to your, to your question about a session for me is very different because I want to take two or three main principles. I want to hammer on them, like do a warm up, talk about awareness or puck control or puck positioning when you're, you know, when you have pressure on you, whatever it is, shooting. And I want to just design a session that focuses on on two or three of those things. And it'll start slow, and you know, like I said, a warm up, then build up to some principles, some tech, focus in on some technique, and then eventually I want to add add variability to it. So take those couple principles that we're working on, and and then make sure that that. It's, I put them in some situations that they may or may not see in a game, but ultimately that they're learning, they're learning the, the, the game situation as opposed to like, Hey, this is what you do every time you're, you have a puck on your forehand coming up the wall and you turn back, you know what I mean? It's, this is something you might do. So for me, it's just trying to, trying to uh, these clickbait words, but like gamify it or make it as game like as possible, even though it's, it's individual selfish skills. But I, 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 I find like what you guys are doing, like you as in coaches, I, I don't envy it um, uh, in terms of like, it's hard to manage the difference between team system stuff and also get skill development stuff in, in practice. You know, it's very, it's a really tough, 
um, it's, it's tough for coaches to do both of those things. So. Yes. Yeah, the details within the drill that actually matter. So mm-hmm. like, I always talk to players about like, you got to personalize this practice. Like, what does it look like for you? It's not just doing what the coach wants, like what details you're adding. Like you randomly adding a, a head fake or you mm-hmm. like expanding the horizons of like the little details that you can do within it um, rather than just doing exactly as it is, you know, almost giving permission to young players for that is, is great. Mm-hmm. I, I find that, um, you know, just communicating you know, why we're doing what we're doing, you know, why are we doing CLA or variability? Yeah. Why am I putting trails that might look ugly into practice? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because, Hey, that's what a game is. Like if you've ever watched a hockey game, you'll know that there's maybe like two or three passes during any like sequence that are like tape to tape and perfect on, you know, usually it's okay. We're going up. Then there's pressure. Now you've got to put an area pass or bank off the wall you know, totally. like it's, that's, that's what the game actually turns into. And just having people see that, cause we've obviously done so much studying of this, like we understand it, but you don't know what you don't know. It's, it's like finding a wealth advisor, like they're the trusted guide there to help you with something that's extremely important to you. In that case, it's your money. In this case, it could be your hockey career, uh, your son or daughter's hockey career. So just understanding what actually these things look like is super important and being able to if you're a coach, educate those folks that are key stakeholders to these things is, is super important. And and I love where you went with like a skills coach, like you're picking out some, maybe some key details that make these other elements easier. Like, oh, now you can do this, whether it be technically, or you're actually seeing like, oh, there's maybe some more op- options. Like one of my favorite is zone entries. Like, okay, we're going to do zone entries, but you've got to do five different ways. Like maybe one's a Gretzky curl, mm-hmm. maybe one's like a kickback, maybe one's like a drive and bank, like a million different ways to go about it of like, or even just like another example for practice, like you can do a flow drill per, perhaps like a five on oh breakout, but each time you have to have a different player that crosses the blue line with the puck. Sure. Yeah. So now you are, you're like going weak to the weak side D and he's driving out or whatever it may be. It's like, you can add these variabilities into even like a flow drill or create like an ugly game environment where it's not so about like the solution itself. It's like finding solution based on the pressure, like the, the mm-hmm. easiest way is like just get rid of all of the the cones on the ice, um, mm-hmm. especially in team practice, just put someone else on the other side. Like they're going to give you a lot of variability. Totally. And what you just said about like breakouts into entries, you know, as a five on O like, yeah, for a coach. Okay. So you need that consistency, that rep, you need your, your winger to know the weak side winger, you know, to, to get here, to get across the ice, whatever. So you get that, but then at the end of it, you get some variability where depending on where the pressure goes, I want you to do, you've got to do this now. So it's not just always doing this set route, you know, and, and I think that's great. And then you mentioned entries. I'm big on entries. Obviously they happen a ton, but Hey, if you've got a drill or a setup, that's, that's got three different entries don't make it the same in the same order all the time. You know, Hey, I want you to do three different things on these entries. And every time just react to this little bit of like soft pressure I'm putting on you. If I'm on the inside, look middle, go outside. If I'm not giving you anything, get down the wall, curl up and hit the high guy, you know? And so now they're, they're, they're thinking while they're also like doing your setup, your drill and that, that adding those things in is is massive. So I think you can add them in. I mean, I'm big on it, adding them in in skill sessions. I think it's easier for me just because I have one focus and I can be selfish on, on each player. But then for, for coaches, it uh, takes a little bit of planning, takes a little bit extra time. Um, I think adding those in there is huge. Uh, And depending on what level you coach at, like, I mean, if we're talking about minor hockey, these are not full-time coaches. So they have three other kids and they're running to soccer and then school, you know, function and they're getting to practice at 445, 450 sometimes and then you're sitting in the room tying up your skates and you're looking at your coat your your buddy you know your coaching partner like hey what, what should we do today and i'm not saying everything's everyone's like that but i think outsourcing some of this to people that do do this for a living that do have have a chance to to take the extra time you know what i mean for you to reach out to me you know your kids way better than i do you see them three four five times a week reaching out to someone that that you trust to say hey one coach you know i'll how kids are, they're going to listen to the same message from a different voice, you know, sometimes much better than they will. Like half the kids on your team, they were at your house on the weekend and they were jumping on your couch and you were yelling at them. So they don't, they need a break from you, you know, is one, but 
going to someone and saying, Hey man, we're really struggling with this. Can you, can we work on this? This is what I, these are the things I'm trying to teach them. And then I can come prepared or me or someone like me can come prepared and say, Hey Greg, you know, why don't, why don't we do this? I like these things. Is this good with you? And, and, and even why don't we do this as a full team? Then we split up into groups and you take the forwards, I'll take the D you know, you do this and and I can help you do that because that's what I, what, what, what someone like me does for a living and take the onus off you a little bit, you know, and help you prepare. Like, I think it's really, really crazy that at the junior, at the pro college, pro levels, people employ skill coaches and that at minor hockey skill coaches or sorry, um, minor hockey coaches are so possessive sometimes that they don't want to get extra help. I, I think that's a very, very, uh, I think it's very, very interesting that, and and maybe some of it's just just not knowing, but I, I think most of it's probably being um, a, a bit a bit nervous about you know thinking like they don't want to admit like hey I need help with something, but it's very it's very very interesting how many higher levels so let's say major junior and up teams have skill coaches and how how minor hockey teams don't um, you know but it's I think that just comes down to the coach. Well. I think it's nice. It's it's kind of like um, the old saying of like, you always need to be working to replace yourself, like mm-hmm. almost taking yourself out so you can worry on bigger picture stuff or different items. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like when I'm able to, whether it be handing off to an assistant or someone else, like, all right, you're kind of like running the activity or have activities that don't involve a coach at all. Like if you're doing a two on two, you could basically do offense, defense out, have that rotation go, never have a coach ever enter. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to go to the back of the line, have conversations. Oh, have you thought about trying this? Like, Oh, what were you reading there? Huge. Like that's massive. Uh, So why, whether it's someone else is running it or you've removed yourself, I love calling them the coachless activities, like running Mm -hmm. the coachless activity where you're actually being able to go in and coach, not be the one running the drill, which when you're thinking about, okay, what's the higher value activity there? It's probably actually coaching, actually teaching. And I think that's huge what you just said, like for a head coach to, you know, delegate for sure um, and have their assistant coaches. But when someone else is running stuff, go and engage with your players, whether it's what you said, uh, like just going into a, I know he's been struggling with this, so I'm going to pull him aside and work with him or just going and having a conversation with him and create helping create that relationship where you're not like running a drill and on him, you know, on him or her, like where you're, they're feeling like you're always teaching, like just go that th- those little times where you can just say, Hey, how are things going? Or make a joke with them. Like those create the relationships, create the trust that are that long-term are going to help you to work together or help you work with that player. So, yeah, I think it's huge to take it for coaches to take advantage of those opportunities, you know, and those, like, I like what you, I like what you called it. Those, those coachless opportunities, um, where they can they can just engage with the players. Love it. Um, something I did want to ask you about is like what goes into a coaching toolbox? Um, you know, we all have like these different roles and responsibilities, mm-hmm. but the the base tools are all the same. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I've found the greatest drill ever. And like finding great drills is not part of the coaching toolkit, like you know, like your totally. toolbox of skills. You know, like, so what actually goes into a coaching toolbox that you can pull from that makes you an effective coach? Uh, I totally agree with you. I think drills essentially don't matter. Um, it, you know, we, you and I can run the same drill, the J drill, the most overused drill ever, you know what I mean? And and I can just do it and have the players wheeling through it. No problem. And you can do it and offer, Hey, make sure your shoulder checking as you're turning, make sure the passer does this. And, and then there's a little bit of functionality a bit of bit of use to it you know so I, I totally agree I mean I think the 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 as far as the coaching toolbox it's a bit different for everyone um uh for me it's it's one is trust so so getting players parents to understand that you know and that trust comes with communication but getting them to understand what the plan is whether it's someone that I work with uh, every week or someone that that comes to one of our academies and and I see you know multiple times a week or, or just a team that we're going out with, um, you know, once, Hey, can you come out and help us with this? We want to do some shooting stuff or, or skating stuff, whatever. I think, I think just making sure you communicate with the coaches and, and the players ahead of time. So they know what they're, what they're in for. So that's one that, that creates, helps create that relationship. And then, um, being engaged, there's, there's nothing more for me is like not being engaged is probably one of my biggest pet thieves. So seeing coaches or skill guys on the sidelines while things are happening, I just think if you're not going to be engaged in a session, how do you expect your kids to be there? You know, and, and how do you, like, how do you expect them to, to, to want to, 
to engage in what you're doing if you don't. So I, I think that's huge. And that might be a little bit different than what you were expecting in terms of that, that it didn't, didn't include any of the actual skill development. But I, I think actual skill development is hard to do if you don't have those kind of outside factors, you know, I mean, trust and communication and, and, and that's, that's not even getting to the way I'm teaching shooting or the way I'm teaching skating or transitioning or angling, whatever it's, I think you need those like, foundational blocks you know those building blocks before you even get to the what drill are we doing what skills are we working on you know but but for me yeah it's creating the relationships with the players communicating with players coaches parents even depending on the ages and then and then and then engaging with them is is like the whole time you're out there is is uh is how is how eventually you're going to get to you know make helping them and making changes and making progress with them yeah i, I find it like a, a double-edged sword like the, the engagement piece, because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times you say be engaged and immediately people are like, oh, you're constantly in everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And for me, I'm like, I'm not trying to be a micromanager. Right. Like I want to do a lot of observation. Like that's mm -hmm. for me, I think that's a, a key coaching skill is the, the power of observation. Like where do you position yourself on the ice to take in information that's key to help you have great conversations with players or help them make adjustments, whether it be a technique or a tactical element. Um, like for me, I, I love watching practice back at least once over. Like I yeah. feel like you just pick up so much more information going to the live barn uh, like that you just possibly could never see if you're out there. Like yeah. even if you position yourself at the red line facing it, you know, one end of the ice or like even straight across, like your field of vision is only so far. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I, I'm constantly thinking about those types of things. And I would say that's engagement, not just like totally. being in running the drill, which I think most people's minds go to. That's a good distinction. So I appreciate you saying that. Cause yeah, it doesn't mean just like me being engaged. Isn't just cause I was standing in the middle of the ice yelling for, for the whole 50 minute session. You know, it, it means, it means taking an info adapting as things are going on. Like, Hey, this is going well, we can add more to this. Oh, Hey, this isn't going very well. We got to tailor it back or we got to call the kids in right now and, and just say, Hey, we can get this. I know we're struggling. You know what I mean? That like, that's engagement to me going over and telling someone that has, has really had a couple rough, rough reps, just tapping them on the shin pads and saying, Hey, you got this. No worries. Like mistakes are awesome. You know what I mean? Someone that's doing what you're working on pretty easily going over and saying, Hey, try this, make it a little harder now, you know, like whatever it is, like that is engaged. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And, 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 that none of that comes without what you're saying, which is observation, you know, and when I say engaged, I just mean, you can't be the coach that's out there on your cell phone or just standing in the back corner, just like what's going on, you know, cause kids yeah, feed safety off. issue even there. Right. Yeah. Well, totally. But kids feed off that. You know what I mean? They know if you're checked out or I'm a, I'm a coach and I'm asking a question, Hey coach, what do you think about this? And coach is like, Oh, sorry. I, uh, I don't know what, what was the question. Like kids feed off that. They take that as an opportunity. Like, well, that's how they're going to be. But, um, but yeah, I, I, the observation part is ma massive and I, and I, 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 I'm glad you made that distinction because you're absolutely right. And it is a, um, engagement is a, that can include a lot of things, but, but I, I think I'm on the same, I agree with you in terms of how I look at it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just be screaming your head off. You're, you're not <laughs> actually thinking at that point. So I, I love that distinction. And you, you brought up a, a great thing, um, that at the younger ages, they, they totally are okay with it. Um, as they go through puberty, they may have struggled with the relationship with this. Um, and by the time they get to adults, they understand the value of it, which uh, the, the phrase you used were, were mistakes are awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and being under able to understand that failure is going to happen. If you're looking to have 100% and the highest success you can right away, you are going to be very short lived in whatever you're doing because you're never going to truly be able to expand your horizons far enough. Um, and this is something I even see with scouting. I'm like, if you don't see players trying and failing at stuff, that's a red flag and what their future capabilities are. Um, totally. And if you're trying to be like the cool kid, like that's, that's a problem in high school. Like I'm the cool kid. I don't screw up. I'm great. Whatever, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Or just like, you don't want to show that vulnerability. So there's that piece to it as well. But just having a great relationship with trying things, understanding mistakes are part of the process or like, oh, man, the player maybe just got lucky with their, their stick where it was positioned as it was moving out. Um, so it could be a timing thing. Just having a great relationship with failure and mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, I, I, I think it's super important. Uh, and I'm glad you emphasized it like like and, and for the elite kids, it's also 
resi- teaching resilience. Like, Hey, I know you, you, you're telling me you want to make the, the next step and, and you want to like jump to the next level or play here. Or do, but every time you make a mistake, the rest of the session's done. You fold, you know what I mean? Not that you're going to talk to the kid like this, but that's giving you a pretty b- good picture of like where they're going to struggle. You know what I mean? Maybe it's not the actual physical parts of their game, but it's the mental side. Like there's going to be adversity. So why not, you know, why not have mistakes and practices and, and skill sessions so that they, those are little, little opportunities to, for, for players to deal with adversity, not massive team things. And, but the, that, but that's huge for them to, to go through all those little battles. If it's too easy, it's, it's never going to be like that in the game. You know, like we talked about, uh, even for those 0.001 percenters, like they're still, they're still going, you know, it might seem easy, but it's not. Um, but for the middle of the pack, it's never going to be easy. So why, um, we want to make it seem, uh, similar in skill sessions, you know, but it is a fine line. Cause you also don't want failure after failure after failure, you know, like, like, and I, I mean, even like a rep, a rep to go poorly, poorly, poorly. And now players are getting too frustrated. You know, it's a fine line between we want some difficulty and mistakes are great between managing, you know, what they view as failure. So it, it, it's tough, but yeah, mistakes are huge. And that goes back to like practices. When I said like practices should be ugly. That means mistakes are happening. That means player lost a puck and then has to go get it and then fire a, a no look, you know, a cross ice pass with not a lot of time. And then it goes to that next player picking up a pass. Like you said, that's not, not very good. And you know what I mean? So that, that creates a lot of um, the ugliness creates a lot of uh, mistakes and opportunities for, for players to to figure it out. Yes. I love that. Uh, All right. More ugly practice. Let's go, baby. Um, (laughs) I got three quick areas. I kind of want to hit on Mm -hmm. here as as we kind of come to the end of our conversation. Um, The first one I think is really important. And I think it especially personifies where where you're currently at in your role, which is like having players understand there's a massive difference between having an asset and how that asset is actually used. Because if you're just, for example, fast, fast, fast all the time, you're not going to be as effective as someone who knows how to use that speed by using it in change of speed. Um, And there's other examples and I can let you you run with that, but I'm curious to, to dive down this rabbit hole a little bit of, you know, you have this great asset, this great skill, whatever it may be, this great technique, but how do you actually utilize it to be most effective? Yeah. Speed is such a tricky one because it's always like, go skate. You know what I mean? The faster you are, the better you are. There's lots of fast players who, who aren't, uh, who aren't the most successful players or, you know what I mean? The, the, aren't the, they're, they're trying too hard. <laughs> totally. And McDavid's a bad example. Cause it's a McDavid. He has no holes in his game. You know what I mean? But his ability to utilize speed changes is, is makes his speed way more dangerous than it actually is. You know, he's, he, he'll pull up on you and, and cut and make a pass or, or cut and shoot, or he'll just flat out beat you wide. He'll beat you laterally. You know what I mean? He can beat you with his speed any, any way. Um, someone like Kane is obviously a, elite puck handler but like if you look at his speed not not you know what you'd consider fast but his ability to change speeds and slow the game down and is you know what i mean is 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 next level and that's not talked about enough um it's just always his puck handling but but he he has such a a next level brain that he's able to like change 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 the change the speed you know what i mean that he makes the the game go to him come to him Look at someone, and I don't, and I'm not picking on on this player. They're obviously super, super elite. But like Andreas Athanasiu, who plays in Chicago now, he's probably one of the fastest players in the league. Well, why do most players probably not know who he is? He's been on a, multiple different teams over the years. Uh, went to Edmonton uh, a few years back. Probably the idea was for him to play with McDavid, but he's super fast. But it's it's a little bit one dimensional, meaning he scores two to three highlight real goals a year. Like if you look up his highlight real goals, like they're crazy, but why does he not have, you know, 60, 70, 80 points, but he's not able to utilize that speed. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit one direction and, and um, uh, yeah. And, and of course I'm not comparing him to McDavid by any means, cause that's not fair, but if, if you can make it, make it a little bit more game applicable with speed changes and things, he might be a little more dangerous, you know, I should probably blur out his name cause I'm not picking on him. He's crazy good. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a legit NHLer and he scores crazy good goals but that's just a player that comes to mind you you um he's from the you're played in the area here that's like crazy fast and we don't hear enough from he's so skilled it's it's, it's crazy um but yeah i think i think just but like and then if we circle back to what we talked about a, a while ago like making sure players 
um, you know, if we're talking about making, making sure they know who they are, what type of style they are, even with their game, Hey, you're really fast. We can break it down even farther. You're really fast, but now we got to utilize cutbacks. When you see holes, you got to be able to move laterally into them. And then you can start breaking down how to do that puck placement crossovers, you know, your eyes. Um, we look at, look, look at the, um, the McDavid goal on O'Reilly from whatever that was four or five years ago. Everyone knows what it is. He was coming down the left wing, cutting across the blue line towards the middle. What made that move so great? It was his eyes. If you look at that play, his eyes made that play. And then, of course, elite speed and, and cutback. But if he wouldn't have sold the middle with his eyes, that whole thing would have never happened. Riley would have never crossed over. He would have never got a couple feet of, of space to cut to the outside. So I think it's just important for players to know that there's speed is important, but speed alone will not be the difference maker. There's got to be other elements inside of that. You know, and then, like, if you take shooting, I was working with a, a really high level, um, college player like NCAA player female yesterday and and we were working on shooting through screens so um and she's like well I would never shoot there and I'm like I know that isn't what your brain says to do on first first touch but that's why we're working on this because it's not your first option like you love to beat players drive wide cut to the middle get through them get into their hands that's awesome but like should adding a little bit of a shooting mentality could that help you you know, maybe there's only five seconds left in the period when you get on entry and you've got to shoot through the screen to get it on net or, you know, like, like look at a guy like Matthews. He's obviously shoot first. He's, he's one of the best shooters of all time. If you don't play Matthews the right way, will he dangle you? Yeah, of course. He'll pull the puck tight to his feet. He'll get it to the outside and he'll drive on you. He scored some really good goals. So making these fast players more versatile, making these players that, that are drive, you know, drive first mentality, uh, able to uh, give them, make them more of a shooting threat. Or vice versa, someone that that likes to shoot, make them a threat to to drive. Like just adding other elements to the the thing that you're really good at is obviously going to make you a little bit more dangerous. Yes, like challenging the players and challenging yourself to find different ways to utilize the great asset that you, have. you have. Yeah, hands, shot, feet, brain, whatever it is. Um, you know, and adding variability is obviously great. We've talked about that multiple ways, and here's just another example uh, of doing that where now you've got an A and B and maybe even C level game, or if you're, you know, the best of the best in the world, all the way down to F. Um, mm -hmm. And and, and the, the example of that McDavid goal against uh, Morgan Riley in Toronto is a great example. Like, he comes up, he slows down, takes the middle, and is literally going across. Like, he's not even attacking that remotely. It's almost like he's buying time, and he's just waiting and trying to bait Morgan Riley into something mm -hmm. where now boom I'm in control and change of speed and we're off yeah yeah uh, that's that's awesome uh question I have for you now kind of going towards uh your work with the pros here so you got uh you and Dwayne now working with the Red Wings I know you guys worked on development camps uh in the past I'm curious like what was like the goals what are you trying to accomplish in development camp uh because I'm very very curious about what chicago did this past year which is they never even stood a skate on ice mm -hmm. uh the entire development camp so like what are most teams trying to get out of it or do you think some teams are just kind of going through the motions saying oh we all have it mm -hmm. um and like maybe what's a good development camp and you know is chicago doing good things there or should, more teams mm -hmm. should follow that or no um i yeah we, we definitely was it was conversation piece last year in terms of like hey what chicago was doing now i don't know i don't know this i'm speculating i don't know if that had a little bit to do with bedard or not you know what i mean maybe maybe it did maybe it didn't uh being there and keeping him off the ice I, but i i think what's happening and I, I think this trend is is happening and, and even in detroit this year we're gonna have a little bit less ice uh camp might even be a little bit shorter um because what happens is like some of these elite players they they have a season, whether it's college or junior, and then maybe they have a camp to go to, or or then they have a world junior camp in the summer. It, you know, and their their summers are so broken up that they don't really get a good chunk to just train. Um, you know, between their time off and then maybe a vacation and then all the development camp and world junior camp, whatever. So I, I think the 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 idea was to keep them off the ice so that they could just keep one. They're not getting uh, oh, you know, they're not we're not overusing them or overworking them in the off season. And they're able to just focus on their off ice training because it's so broken up because what happens with development camp? Well, you take maybe a couple days, light days before it. So you get ready and then you do development camp. Sometimes they're kind of baggers and then you get home and you take a couple days off and it's really choppy. Right. So I think that's the idea. Um, and for us in, in Detroit, it's, it's low impact, meaning days are not super long. A lot of times the guys are done by like one, two o'clock. 
they're going to the Tigers game or they've got like social events set up, you know, cooking classes and, and things like that in the afternoons. Uh, and then, and the, the, the workouts are not necessarily what a, a regular workout would be. And the ice session is not necessarily like a bagger, meaning like a conditioning skate. It's more like touches and it's, Hey, are, are these the things you're working on at home? You know, if, if they are great, keep doing what you're doing. If they're not, then this is a bit eye opening. And like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta start doing the right things. Um, but I do think there's going to start to be a little bit of a shift in the NHL where more and more teams are doing less and maybe even some not going on the ice at all. And I don't totally disagree with it. I, I really don't. Um, as a skill guy, I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, it might seem weird that I'm saying that, but the idea is hopefully these guys are still going, girls are still going home working with their people at a reasonable amount. You know, like we talked about earlier, not five times a week in May and June as they get ready for for camp. You know, and everyone's different though. You got to look at college. Colleges, NCAA is sending their players back in like middle of June, end of June sometimes to train. Um, be on the ice. You can't be on the ice with the coaches, but they're on the ice a little bit. Um, pro is a little bit different depending on where you, NHL, AHL, East Coast, whatever. You know, junior starts middle of August. Pro is like end of September, October. Like it, it also depends where you're heading next and to what you're how much you should be on the ice in the summer, when you should start ramping it up. Everybody's a little bit different, but yeah, I think the NHL is going to start to tailor back. It, develop, development camp used to be a bit more of a, a tough week. And I, I think everyone's tailoring it back a bit. Yeah. And what are you as a person design? I'm assuming you're designing the sessions themselves. Like what, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing as you're, you know, like what's your, take us into the thought process of Kevin and Dwayne yep. as they're designing a development camp. Like what's the session, that session going to, you know, what, so what are we we'll doing do, and why? We'll do like three days, normally two to three days of uh, the day of testing, like on ice testing. Um, uh, and then we'll have two or three days of sessions. They'll be on the ice, you know, twice, maybe once as a group. Uh, normally it'll be split forward D we'll pick a couple key principles that we want to, that we want to work on for that week. I mean, you can't touch on everything, um, you know, some of the, some of the guys have, have been there for multiple years. So we'll always try to keep it fresh, keep the same principles, but keep the stuff we're doing a little bit fresh, a little bit different. And, and when we put that stuff together, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's taking a high emphasis on like monitoring, um, rest, you know, rest ratios so that they're, they're not, not too much, but whether it's wall play, wall play is a big one every year. It's just so such a big part of the game, but focus a lot on wall play, making little plays from there, attacking dots and shooting. Like, you know, if the, let's say those are our concepts. So we'll design some drills and then station station based setups where where they're focusing on those couple things. Maybe the D it's uh, retrievals and then, you know what I mean? Being evasive, moving up, moving up the ice. And then, of course, there's offensive zone, um, whether they're pinching and, you know, diving down to create offense or walking the line you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll grab some things and then we'll say, Hey, these are the kind of three things we want to focus on over the next couple of days for the, for the uh, forwards. And these are three or four things for the D and then we'll put little video session, little like video, nothing crazy, five or six videos each day for the session where we'll go and be like, Hey, here's the couple, this is what we're thinking. This is kind of what we had in mind for this, but like, be creative. This doesn't have just cause we're seeing Makar do it right now. This is not how I want you to do it. And definitely don't want you to do all seven things that Makar just did. Let's do one of the things that Makar did, you know, that's pretty effective on its own. So just isolating like a, a couple key skills and key things that, that we want them to, as a group to work on. Does the great organization have influence on this or do they kind of give you guys like, or are they doing either the old, like, Hey, here's what we want to see you know, kind of create the sessions around this. These are the principles that the coaching staff's giving you, mm -hmm. or is it more of an open-ended like, Hey, Dwayne and Kevin, you guys are great at what you do. You know, the world's your oyster. It's a little bit of both. They definitely trust, but, but Dwayne being there full time, you know, the development team is, is really great. They spend a lot of time just chatting, watching video in the coach's room, you know, uh, whatever it is. So, so uh, yes and no yet. Yeah, they're always talking about stuff. So it's, it's not like we're, we're saying, oh, you know what? We should work on batting pucks out of out of the air because that's how we're going to score three goals this year. You know, it's 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 pretty fundamental things that you're seeing night in and night out. Of course, that that we're going to focus on, and uh, sometimes I like to get outside the box and do some fun things. Sometimes, but I I they're not coming down with like, hey, this is what you do because 
Dwayne's on the same page as them and is is kind of knows where their head's at. And there's there's definitely conversations though. We'll jump on a call and just say, hey, really want our D to 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 do these 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 things. And then of course, with like some of the prospects, it's like, hey, we want this specific guy or this group of these group of players have to do some of this. So maybe we pull them aside. Or, you know, to your point, um, you know, you get a coach, maybe I'm running something and Dwayne's pulling someone aside because they're like, hey, really want you to try this and focus on this for the rest of the summer. You're not going to make massive changes in someone in two or three days. Uh, in some cases, you're not even going to make changes at all. You're just going to alert them to like, hey, keep working on this over the summer and want you to prep, you know, uh, try to implement some of this into your game coming into next year. You know, whether you're going back to college or junior or or to the, to the you know, pro team, you know, so it's, um, yeah, it's a mix of both, but it's, everyone's pretty much on the same page in terms of what, what the players need to do. Awesome. All mm -hmm. right. Last, last bit that I want to touch on, and we'll open mm -hmm. it to, to whatever you, wherever you want to go with this, but, uh, what separates the AHL versus the NHL? Like I look at an Austin Sarnick, I'm like, that kid is sweet or Carter camper. I'm like, that guy's awesome, mm -hmm. but they never made that jump to the NHL. Um, I'm curious just from your perspective, being literally in it on a day-to-day -day basis, pretty much with Grand Rapids of like, what separates AHL versus NHL? Mm. There's plenty of guys in the NHL that are faster than a lot of guys in the NHL. I know that for one. Yeah, totally. And Zarni's a really, he's a, he's a pro. He's an awesome guy. He's obviously elite at the HL level. Got a good chance to play, especially end of the year with, with Detroit, you know, on their bottom six and even played up a little bit. Like, like he's just, he's not great at anything. He's really good at everything. He sees the ice really well. You know what I mean? Offensively at that NHL level, he's, he's good. Uh, offensively at the HL level, he definitely adds a little, you know, he's able to add a little bit more. Um, but it, sometimes it's just situational. It's, it's the team, you know, you, you've seen, I'm sure you could think of guys where you're like, Hey, on this team, they're a bottom six, but on this team, they're a middle six, you know, or a D man. That's, that's a middle, you know, three, four guy that would be a top D pairing on, on another team. Like it's situational for sure. Um, for players like that. Um, and, and not, yeah, it's 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 an organizational decision in terms of of if you're up or if you're down or how much playing time you get. But what separates the players? I, I think like it's a jump. I know you're right there in the HL, but like the NHL is so good. Even those guys that aren't considered that you don't look at as like you know offensive. You know, let's take a a Dave Boland or a Matt Cook. Dave Boland had 120 points in in the in the OHL. Matt Cook had like 80 or 90. Now in uh, in major junior, like neither of those guys you'd look at and be like, wow, they're crazy offensive after watching their pro careers. Like, I think, I think we forget how good it is in the NHL. Like it's, those guys are just next level good, you know, and for guys like Matt Cook and guys like Dave Boland, they, they were able to men mentally change their game where they were, you know, Dave Boland more so like he's a guy that in the playoffs could play on your first line you know, on the road with line matches, but then also play on your third or fourth line and be just an abs absolutely miserable to play against. Um, so, so mentally for those guys, they have to make a shift. Um, and I'm taking out of the equation, like the guys that don't matter, they're just all, you know, offensive at every level and, and, you know, the one or less than one percenters, but, but that's it. And for, for the HL guys, I think some of them can do it. Some of them can make the change. Uh, and then some of them can't. They just think, no, I'm pretty good at this, or I'm doing these things really well already, or I'm, I'm doing it at this level well. Um, it, just because you're doing it at one level well doesn't always mean it's going to translate to the next level, especially when you're jumping to the to the NHL because it's so good. So for for those guys, it's 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 we talked about it with minor hockey players, but there's a lot of conversations like, hey, you just got to do what you're doing, but like keep being hard on pucks and have a really good stick and keep doing the things that matter that don't really matter. You know, they don't show up on the score sheet because that's how you're going to get your your chance. So it's, it's letting them know, um, even for them, they're, they're still kids, like letting them know, like, Hey, this is what's making you successful here, but this is what's going to make you successful at the next level, you know, this stuff plus that. So, um, just, just making sure they know who they are and what they have to do, um, to, to get there. And this is not a decision on me, but some of it again is organizational meaning like, Hey, they want this guy to play this role here. So then you got to help them adapt adapt that mentality, you know, or adopt that mentality a little bit. So it's, it's, um, but I, but if like one thing, like, and I, you kind of snickered when I said, this is like, it's re it's, it's, they're really good at that level. Like they really, really are like, and, and look at a guy like um, Dave Prawn. He's not the swiftest of feet at all. He's, he's been in the league a long time, but how good is he on the wall? Like how good is, is his awareness? You know, last night watching the game, Corey Perry, like they're so smart and they get the game 
why are they able to play at this level still when there's way better players skill wise playing in the HL? Cause they're just, they get it. They understand the role. They understand, you know, what they're doing. Pat Maroon is a, I love Pat Maroon. He gets it like, come on, man. How can that guy play in the NHL? Like I'm it's, it's, and I'm saying this positively, like it's so impressive that that guy is, that he's just, his, his brain is just next level. And, he, and yeah, he's tough as nails that, that definitely helps, but He's able to like get pucks in. No, he knows who he is. You know what I mean? He knows what his role is. Like there's way, there's way more skilled players on, on your high school team. <laughs> like that again, that like joking obviously, but like, but he's playing in the NHL and he's going to keep a job there because he gets the role that he needs to play. And, and for some AHL players, it's really hard to watch players playing in the NHL that they know they're, they're technically more skilled than, but they're just not able to, to, play the role they need to or or make the you know the mental change that they need to so yeah and and you mentioned it just like being great at things that don't show up on the score sheet because mm. you know like you know, the classic example of like the parent or grandparent paying for every goal that little johnny scores like totally, well, that's yeah. it's on the score sheet but at the end of the day the next level or on the next team that you want to play on you know whether it be going from grand rapids to detroit like yeah you're a power play guy but do they even need a power play guy? Like, are you going to step in and tell Patty can like, no, no, I got this. Yeah, totally. And I what said, are you going to, what are you going to be asked to do when you make that jump? Do you know what I mean? Like even as a, as a, an Austin Zarnick, like you said, like he's obviously top, top line guy in the HL, but that's not normally his role playing up. And he's smart enough to know that he changes. He has to change his game a little bit when he, when he gets called up, he's not being asked to play those, those same type types of minutes, you know, what I mean? or even the same quantity of minutes, you know, a player that's playing 20 minutes a night, 18 minutes as a forward, 26 minutes as a D, can they play a little different than a, than a D man that's playing, you know, 18 minutes and a forward that's playing seven? Of course they can. Like playing seven minutes as a forward, you are hundred miles an hour, all game hitting everything that moves, you know, because, because you, you physically, you can do it, but you got to also know like, like that side of the game, manage that side too. But minor hockey, like, and I have this talk with minor midgets all the time. Like you guys are all pretty much the best players on your team. But next year, if you want to play in the O or you want to play junior, that probably won't be your role. It won't be a top three forward, every power play. So even in minor midget, like, and this is a big thing for me, like working with that age kids, keep doing what you're doing, keep adding offense. I get it. It gets you looks, but you better start working on your stick and defensive awareness. And because that is going to be what separates you next year for, from playing at the level. It's not going to be how many goals you score for 99.999% of the guys. There are the, you know, the, the first, you know, there are the few kids that, uh, that are going to get asked to, to add offense next year. Um, but, but most of them, they're not, they're going to play middle to bottom six, maybe 12, 13, forward in that lineup. And then they, and then it's, it's hard for them. So, so for those guys, they have to keep working at their high end skill, but they have to work on the things that are, you know, the, the, the things that are going to keep them their, their pants, their stall in next year. I always tell, I always tell kids this, I'm like, just get your pants, get your stall, and then worry about all the stuff you want to worry about, like move up the lineup. But you can't move up the lineup if you go to camp and you try to go end to end every shift because that's what you're doing in minor midget. It's not going to work at main camp against 18, 19, 20-year-olds. You know, just like it won't work for an HL guy that had a really good year, a really good college player going to going to NHL NHL camp. Like get get your stall first and then worry about how you how you maneuver yourself around the lineup. You know what I mean? Be a good pro or be a good be a good dude, be a good teammate, be on time, you know, do all those things and then be detail oriented. Make sure you're prepared when the coach asks you questions, you know, like whatever the other, you know, and then obviously on the ice, take care of your on ice stuff, but you got to get in the, in the dressing room first before you can worry about that stuff. And I think that's where parents miss and kids miss that step. They're just like, we're going to go for minor hockey. We're going to go right to where we're on the power play in, in the OHL. Well, there's, there's a bunch, there's a bunch in the middle of those two steps that you can worry about first. Awesome. Kevin, this is a wonderful conversation. Uh, that's all I had for mm-hmm. us today. Um, I, I appreciate you drilling down to a lot of the details and the whys behind this. Uh, is there anything else that we should talk about? Oh, I'm, I think if you get me going, I think there's a hundred things that we could talk about, but no, I know I, I enjoy this. This is a lot of fun. I'm, I'm obviously very passionate. I get, I get rolling a little bit and, and rambly on, on some things, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I appreciate the, the chat and, and it was really good. I, I think, we've talked about some really cool and important stuff today and, and there's obviously lots more, but, but I think just, just one 
knowing your knowing your environment are you having a seven eight nine year old that's just having fun or a 16 year old that's just like no they want to play with their buddies have fun awesome keep doing it play a bunch of sports keep getting better you can still even if you're not like your goal isn't to like be elite you can still you still want to get better you still want to score more goals miss you know not miss as many pucks whatever so help out but then if if you know i think a lot of the stuff we talked about was focused on that player that wants to make the jump from double a to triple a or wants to make the jump from junior to pro or you know, HL to, to NHL, whatever. So being dialed, knowing who you are, working with the, you know, trusting and working with the right people um, and, and adding more to your game or, or, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on that stuff and it's, it's super, I can't stress it enough. It's, it's really important. Meat and potatoes, but mm -hmm. the intentionality behind it all. So love it. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, appreciate you coming on. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, hockeysarsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch you buttes here next week for a brand new episode.